Diabetes Connections is brought to you by the only ultra-rapid-acting inhaled insulin and by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, across the country, some kids are already back in school while others will be in class in just a couple of weeks. This can be one of the most stressful times for parents of kids with type 1, and it is okay to admit that. If you approach the situation calm and confidently and not a basket case and calling the school a thousand times, it will be a much better experience for everyone. So I invite all the parents on this call to just take a deep breath and pause and know that you're not alone and this is normal. That's Anna Sabino of Finding Smiles Coaching. She's a diabetes educator who lives with type 1. We're going to go through 504s, school supplies, remote monitoring, last-minute issues, and set you up for long-term success. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome back to another week of the show. Always so glad to have you here. I'm your host, Stacey Sims, and you know we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. Back to school is kind of different for us these days. If you're new to the show, my son was diagnosed right before he turned two, and he will be 18 soon. So we've had lots of back to schools. And Benny's biggest issue this year, what was most important to him so far, has been whether he'd get a parking spot at school. Our district is really overcrowded. Our high school, our middle school, there were too many kids when they opened these schools. His high school is only 10 years old. This will be its 11th or 12th year, I can't remember, but it's very new. And as soon as they opened the doors, it was already overcrowded. So they do a lottery for the seniors to get parking on campus. Crisis averted, he did get a spot, which means he no longer has to walk a half a mile from his car, which is where he parked last year uh, in a public park. Uh, He got up extra early. So he could park on one of the closer spots. So he only had to walk half a mile. This has basically given him an extra 30 to 40 minutes to sleep. So he's very excited. But as far as I'm concerned, I haven't filled out any paperwork yet. Yeah, I mean, gosh, this is such a different situation than it was in years past. Our 504 plan, we will explain more about that during the interview. It holds, so I don't have to worry about that. And our diabetes medical management plan, which is how our district does it. I do have to get that filled out. But at this point, they're not going to kick him out of school for having an insulin pump and a CGM if I haven't dotted every I and crossed every T. But I will get it done. I've got another week as you're listening. Wait, I've got only less than a week because school will start next week for him. But I'll get it done. In elementary school and for many years, I promise I was spot on this. And I did a lot of work to educate and, you know, to make sure it was a very, very smooth transition. He is so independent now that I forget that, you know, legally I still have to do a bunch of things. So I will be taking care of all of that. I promise, especially if you're new. I promise I'm on top of these things. It's just that, gosh, we've been doing it so long now. You know, you kind of relax, which is not something I ever thought would happen. My guest this week is Anna Sabino. Disclosure, she's a friend of mine. I've known her for many years. And I first spoke to her for the podcast back in 2016 when she was at Glue, which became the T1D Exchange. And then she spent a lot of time at the College Diabetes Network. I was thrilled to find out earlier this year that she has started her own company. It is called Finding Smiles Coaching to help families navigate the ages and stages of type 1 diabetes. She has an offer for her coaching. I'm going to put that in the show notes, and we mentioned it at the very end of the interview, but I definitely highly recommend Anna. I go to her with a lot of my own questions, (laughs) even though Benny is almost an adult. Oh, I can't bring myself to say that. She is a certified diabetes care and education specialist. She has a master's in social work, and she was diagnosed with type 1 herself in kindergarten. I realized as I was putting this episode together that this is episode 504, which is so funny when we're talking about back to school. I honestly did not plan it this way. I did not realize it when I put it on the editorial calendar. I only realized it right before I started voicing the episode. I shouldn't assume that everybody gets that, a 504 plan refers to Section 504 of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it's a plan that everybody puts together and you sign at school. It makes sure that any child, not just kids with diabetes, any child who has a disability receives accommodations that will ensure their academic success. You give them access to the learning environment, that kind of thing. So yeah, episode 504. 
And I will talk to Anna in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Afrezza. Quick biology fact, did you know your lungs have the surface area of a tennis court? That's interesting, right? But why is it important? Well, since Afrezza is a powder you inhale, the insulin is delivered through the large surface area of the lungs, which allows for ultra rapid absorption. The insulin passes through your lungs into your blood in less than a minute. Your blood sugar may start to lower in about 12 minutes. That is glucose management in the moment. Find out more and see if Afrezza is right for you. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Afrezza logo. Afrezza can cause serious side effects, including sudden lung problems and low potassium, and is not for patients with chronic lung disease such as asthma or COPD or for patients allergic to insulin. Tell your doctor if you've ever smoked, have ever had kidney or liver problems, a history of lung cancer, or if you are pregnant or breastfeeding. Most common side effects are low blood sugar, cough and sore throat. Severe low blood sugar can be fatal. Do not replace long-acting insulin with Afrezza. Afrezza is not for use to treat diabetic ketoacidosis. Please see full prescribing information, including boxed warning, medication guide, and instructions for use on Afrezza dot com slash safety. Anna, welcome. Here we are back to school. Thanks for jumping in. I appreciate you spending some time with us. Oh, I'm so excited to be here, Stacey. Thank you. You got it. Before we start talking here, you live with type one, but you also have little kids. Are they back to school? Are they old enough for school? Uh, yes. So I have lived with type one for 33 years. Um, I was actually diagnosed halfway through my kindergarten year oh, of school. Wow. And my daughter just turned five and is going back to school in a couple weeks. And I just I can't believe it. I can't believe we're at this point in 2022 already. It's exciting, though. But you know, it's great to start at that kindergarten level, because I was never more nervous sending Benny to school. You know, he was diagnosed at two. He's going to be a senior in high school this year. But I got to be honest with you, sending him to kindergarten was very difficult. It was so stressful. Why don't we just start? I mean, there's nuts and bolts. There's 504. There's lots to talk about that way. But can you address that that emotion, that, that fear, that pressure that I think all parents, I mean, you just mentioned, you know, your child going to kindergarten without type one. Yeah. I mean, knock on wood, my daughter does not live with diabetes. And I'm still a nervous wreck as a parent. So I'm just, you know, there is the school supply list. There is, we don't know, even know who her teacher is yet. There are so many new things. And what I like to do is just a little bit of a reframe and really remember that this is as much of a transition for everyone involved, whether you are a parent, whether you are a school nurse, whether you are a principal, a teacher, this is a new year for everyone. And for parents, especially if you have a child that was diagnosed over the summer or in the last six months, there is so much to process and worry about. And it's so easy for our minds to just think ahead. What if they don't count the right carbs? What if she forgets to bolus? What if she goes low in the middle of class and doesn't speak up? Oh, there's so much to think about. And The goal is to have a successful school year for everyone. And the one thing I will say here, and I'll probably reiterate this again, you know, many times when we're talking, Stacey, is that if you approach the situation calm and confidently and not a basket case and calling the school a thousand times, it will be a much better experience for everyone. So I invite all the parents on this call to just take a deep breath and pause and know that you're not alone and this is normal. Yeah, to kind of rein all that in because we all do worry. Let's talk about setting things up for success. You know, most people will go right to thinking about a 504 plan and we definitely, we will talk about that. But I'm curious, you know, any age, right? As you said, newer diagnosed may have more to deal with, but any age going to school, you know, you mentioned working with the school, not calling them every day, but How do you recommend parents approach school staff? There are, you know, specific steps that you can take, 100%. I would first recommend calling the school. If you haven't already and your child is going back in two weeks, or if you're keeping your kid home for six months or so, I would do as much of your homework, you know, ahead of time. And when you do reach out to the school for the first time, Make sure it's with a phone call and not necessarily an email. I think for schools, especially over the summer, they're much more likely to answer the phone, especially a principal's office or a central administration office. And I would ask them questions 
confidently, who is the best person to connect with about a medical condition? And I would use those phrases instead of, you know, type 1 diabetes and insulin pumps, because likely the person on the phone over the summer has no clue what that is. I would also ask, uh, you know, once you do get connected with the, the right person at that school, how has this worked in the past with other students with complex, you know, medical conditions? They are the ones going to be ultimately in charge of your child during the day. So they want to feel empowered at the under, other end of the phone or in a meeting to be successful. Your job as the parent is to set them up for success. So if we as the parent can meet them where they are in their comfort level, it's going to go a long way. Now, if the school has never dealt with a child with type 1 or it's been several years and you know technology's out of date, that sort of thing, then you know when you're going into either that first meeting with everyone that you might need to bring you know a little more paperwork or some homework. But if a school is used to type 1 diabetes and they've had a child or two or three recently that's used technology, ask them what has worked well in the past because you want them to be successful right out of the gate and giving them a chance to let you know what works well for them and what they're comfortable with will allow you to meet them where they are and be much more likely to work together as a team. That's such a great point. I mean, I know that there are different schools of thought here where it's, you know, this is how we do it at home and I want the exact same level of care and exact same type of care at school. That can be really difficult. You know, as a parent who, as I said, my son was diagnosed at two and we sent him to daycare a week later, know. you know, and he's he, I'm such a bad parent. And he, actually, no, I shouldn't not. say that. It was, it was great. It worked out so well for us. Uh, we were very lucky. But part of that was because we were always willing to meet the people that were caring for him halfway. It was more about, okay, how can we adjust his schedule when he's at school to make it easier for staff? And there are some things you, you know, obviously you can't do, but there's a lot that you can. So I'm glad to hear you yeah. say that because I think it's a really good way to be successful to say, you know, we really are a team. I mean, you can go home and grouse about it. You go home and of I course. wish this were perfect. It's not perfect. Yes. But talking about it like it's a team goes a long way. So let's jump into 504 plans. I'm not going to go into a deep dive here. I will link up some really good examples from the American Diabetes Association, yes. from JDRF as well, so that as you listen, you can go and see what other people have done, what these organizations recommend. And I also want to say that some school districts like ours only use the 504 plan for testing. So they kick in in third grade, let's say. And we have a diabetes medical management plan that covers much of what many other parents have to put into a 504. Things like dosing and bathroom breaks and all that kind of stuff. That's in the DMMP. And the 504 is simply for testing. So I say all that to just, again, you know, show there are different experiences. But I'm curious, Anna, what you think is vital for either a 504 or a DMMP? Like what has to be signed off yeah. in your opinion by the end of what has to happen at school? Yeah. So this is tricky, right? Because, you know, what goes into any sort of plan or written, you know, agreement or, you know, written anything that the school can understand about the day in the life of T1D in order to keep them safe is going to be completely different and written differently for, say, a high schooler versus, mm -hmm. you know, an eight-year-old. They have different experiences in schools. The common denominator here is that, you know, we want children living with a medical condition that needs constant attention to be safe. And I've sort of laid out, you know, whether or not it is a 504 plan versus, you know, an individualized health plan versus that DMMP the big kicker and differentiator between this 504 plan, which you know stems from Section 504 of the Americans with Disabilities Act, blah, 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 you guys can all read about that, is that it is legally binding. And what is so critical about the 504 is that the school cannot not accept you or not legally allow you to do all these things if they receive any sort of federal funding. And this is a question that you obviously, you know, want to ask, uh, you know, the school personnel and whatnot. 504 plans are very common in most school districts and in, in all school districts, they should be. And I think there are three critical things worded customizably to, to whatever makes sense for your child that should be included in whatever form or document works best for you and your, you know, school experience. 
And the first one is really about missed assignments and excused absences, right? Because there will be times when whether or not your, you know, your high school wakes up with a bloody site and they're 400 and they can't go to school that day, or your third grader has ketones that morning, or they've been up all night with a really bad low and they're really grumpy and you just want to keep them home. Or your four month endo appointment has been rescheduled three times and it's in the middle of a school day and you just need this appointment. Mm. The kicker here is making sure that you include something around excused absences for diabetes related appointments and illnesses. Because the last thing you want is to be penalized for missing an exam or a group, anything school related, when it comes to, you know, those unexpected, annoying moments when diabetes interrupts us at home, you know, especially in the older grades when attendance and tardiness, you know, really impacts your kind of more academic career. You know, the second thing, and I'm sort of bunching a couple things together here, is really around the two words, immediate access. And this can include access to the bathroom at any time, access to water at any time, and probably the most important, access to any and all diabetes-related equipment. And this includes use of cell phones, food and drink, low supplies, um, within close proximity. So, you know, if you're a high school student and you carry your backpack around from class to class to class, obviously, you know, making sure that your phone is on you, maybe even an extra charger, you have glucose handy on you at all times. Now, if you're in kindergarten and you're probably in the same classroom the majority of the day, it's making sure that that one classroom has a designated area or whether it's in the desk or wherever it makes sense for your teacher and classroom that you have access to all of those things. Um, and this may end up being multiple, you know, written out bullet points, um, whether it's, you know, access to water at all times, or, you know, student will keep cell phone under desk and access when needed. You right. know, it can be, there's certain ways you can word it. And if you Google it, you will find it, I promise. And thirdly is really designated around the inclusivity piece. I actually used to work for the American Diabetes Association and worked with a lot of parents and teens, especially around making sure that they were not penalized for missing prom or, you know, those types of activities like field days and sports tryouts because of, a you know, unwanted low or high blood sugar. I remember specifically one high school student said, called me in tears because this wasn't explicitly written in the 504 and she missed making the volleyball team as a sophomore because she missed the first two t- days of tryouts, one for a severe low, second day her site ripped out at lunch. Oh, wow. And she was 400 and couldn't do it. And so making sure that it includes all school-related activities will protect you from, from it all, I guess is what I'm, I'm trying to say there. So whether it's a, a field trip that you have to miss or you know any sort of school-related activity, should be written in there in some way, shape, or form. And this also, obviously, if you want a school nurse to attend a field trip or a parent to allow access to attend the field trip, that's part of that as well. Um, But making sure the inclusivity is there from an equal opportunity standpoint is crucial. I have a lot of questions. (laughs) I'm sure you do. (laughs) Again, we'll we'll link up examples so you can see the language here. But One of the things about phones, too, that I I think is really important, and I don't know that you need to write it in 504 plans. It it really depends. And and I'd love your opinion on this, Anna, because, you know, I I just have my one experience really with Benny. We use the cell phone so infrequently now. You know, he's very independent, but we used it every day in middle school. We didn't use it and he didn't use it to see his numbers because he uses a tandem and it's right on the pump. So I had no issue with him just like every other kid in his in his middle school and high school, the policy was they have like a little cubby. So if you have your cell phone, you stick it in the cubby when you walk in the classroom and then you get it when you leave. Mm-hmm. So if he needed it, it was right there, you know, and he we would only text about food. So it was always like, hey, did you bowl us for lunch? That kind of thing. Or here's your reminder. And I, again, this is not a judgment. As parents, we really have to make these decisions for ourselves and what works best for our family. But are you talking about, you know, having access to your cell phone all day long to communicate with parents or having access to cell phone to check blood sugars 
And then what do you do about kids who honestly aren't ready for that kind of responsibility and are playing games and get in trouble for stuff like that on their phones? I mean, isn't this a bigger question than Stacy in terms of parenting in general around yeah. trust? <laughs> I mean, it's a blessing and a curse that we have this amazing technology constantly giving us data and the opportunity to better understand our kids' diabetes, right? I mean, we all know that. Diabetes tech is amazing for what it is, but it also can be a real hurdle and a challenge sometimes and not work, frankly. <laughs> but again, you know, I would really ha start having these conversations around communication in that very first phone call with the school. Find out how they have seen this work in the past. You know, if it's an elementary school, I have seen a lot of nurses jump right on the opportunity to also, you know, download, you know, say the follow app and follow the child's blood right. sugar and communicate with the parent via text a dozen times a day about either what to bolus or what to not, or give full trust to the school to manage that. You know, again, you know, if it's a high school student and they've been living with type one like Benny for years, the high school nurse may only see the student when there's an issue, you yep. know, once a week. And so, again, this is going to, you know, like you said earlier, really depend on the comfort level of the kiddo and the school nurse. But talking about it up front you know, this is what works well for us at home. And I would use an example, you know, if you're a parent who is really nervous or, or concerned about how this might work, you know, this is where, you know, you could bring in a Dexcom and bring in the phone and let the school nurse or the coordinator or whoever it may be play around with the app. You know, this is going to take a lot of gradual exposure. And I invite parents to think about what that first week was like back in the hospital when you're being handed this brand new technology and asked to care for one person. And I know this is not what parents want to hear. And school nurses are caring for sometimes hundreds of kids or hundreds of kids in different schools throughout the day. So I think it, you know, there's a way to make it work, whether it's an iPad or whether, you know, you are communicating with your kid, whether it is, you know, it's just an airplane mode and it's, there's different scenarios and ways to make it work. And that's why having an amazing diabetes community, um, whether it's through JDRF or a local group online, you can find out what's worked for others. But I think the, the key here is again, you know, coming up with an appropriate way of approaching the school and figuring out what the comfort level is because the first three to four weeks are going to be messy. <laughs> so there, there will probably be a mistake made and everyone is human. All of us parents who have a child with type one have probably overdosed or given the wrong amount of carb or I don't want to say it, maybe given Humalog instead of Lantus or vice versa. Oh, say um, it. It happens all the time. Everybody does. It that. happens. And so I think we have to remember that School is a transition, again, for the entire team, for the student, for the school nurse, and it's going to take some time to tweak and figure out how it's going to work. I want to talk about remote monitoring, but I, I also think it's worth mentioning. We were just talking about cell phone use and I mentioned playing games. You know, mm -hmm. you can lock down your kid's cell phone. There's mm -hmm. ways to just make certain apps work. So I think that's, you know, that's one way to do it. I also think it's worth noting, and my diabetes educator when Benny was younger reminded me about this all the time. So she has adult sons with type 1. They were diagnosed as kids, but they're like, I, I don't know, I'd say late 20s, early 30s now. And she's always like, we didn't even have a cell phone, you know, for anything. Forget remote monitoring. Like if there was a problem during the day, they had to track me down on a regular phone and everybody did fine and it's okay. And so her perspective was really valuable to me because it took away a lot of that fear. I think sometimes we forget that this kind of technology hasn't been around forever and thousands and thousands of kids went to school and we're fine. Is it better now? Absolutely. I was one of them. Right. I'm sure you had <laughs> I issues. I did that not even been... have, my mom sent me on a school bus without a meter. And if I felt low, I, I you know, the school bus driver knew that I had type one diabetes and I could eat on the bus because there was no eating on the bus. That was right, a big right. We had that too. The management of diabetes as a whole was just different. So that's just how people, I didn't even have a 504 plan. I had a written plan and that everybody just followed it. I also think diabetes as a whole was just less common. 
but that's a story for another day. Yeah. Um, well, and I and I will say I I do think do not get me wrong. I think it is better now in many ways. The tools are better. I think the challenge is using them in a really good way. So let's talk about that yeah. because I'm not biased against, I get accused of this all the time. I'm not biased against remote monitoring or letting the school follow. It just wasn't our experience. By the time right. Benny had share and follow for Dexcom, he was almost in middle school and he was almost yeah. fully independent. And then we found it was better for me to check in on him than the nurse. And I live in North Carolina, by the way. I should have said this at the beginning, mm. where we don't have full-time school nurses until high school. Yeah. So, you know, it's a really different experience than in other parts of the country and it worked out fine. But what's your advice for parents about not necessarily remote monitoring? Because I think that, that ship has sailed. If you have a Dexcom, you're watching. I mean, I'm seeing Benny's numbers yeah. right now and he's asleep, but you know, you're, you're watching. But what about sharing with the school? Like what to think about before you do that? That's a great question, Stacy. And I think again, for parents who, I mean, I have type one, I use you know, full disclosure, I use the the Dexcom CGM. And I now that I'm in it, and I've been in it for several years, I feel much safer knowing I have this technology attached to me 24 yeah. seven, I want to give all of you parents, uh, I want you to give yourselves a pat on the back for dealing with the mental load of constantly having this access to this data, because it can be a lot. And so I would really encourage you to take a pen and paper and really think about why you use this technology. And is it to prevent low blood sugars and prevent high blood sugars? Yes. Is it to monitor the trends and the patterns so you can make adjustments as needed? Yes. But I would think about, I would really think about your target range and safety here. And, and I think the, you know, the goal again for everyone is for them to have a a safe and fun experience at school. Because the last thing you want is, you know, one arrow up at 150 to prompt a call from the nurse and prompt a call home. And I think there, there's something to be said for, you know, if there's an emergent situation and a child comes to the nurse and says, I don't feel good, and you've got double arrows up and they're 350, then obviously some sort of intervention needs to happen. But I would be cautious to set, you know, two close targets when it's going to, at the end of the day, impact the child and the entire school experience and take away from that um, and, and keep all of that in mind as you're going into it. I would also just share something that worked really well for us. This was before the share technology was there, but after we had started on Dexcom. And this worked really well because we didn't have a full-time school nurse. So there really wasn't anybody I wanted following if, if that had even been a, an option. Mm -hmm. So we had regular times during the school day where Benny would check his blood sugar in class, you know, using a finger stick. And it was modeled around the class schedule. So it was all the times you'd think would be obvious before the morning snack, if there was such a thing, before lunch, before PE, before bus, you know, that kind of thing. And so what we did when we got the Dexcom is we just replaced that with, let's look at the Dexcom. So he would look at it instead of doing a finger stick and he would, he was old enough that he, he was young enough that he still needed to show an adult, but he didn't need to go to the nurse or anything. So literally at those same finger stick times every day, he was just looking at the Dexcom. And so it wasn't about needing alerts and it wasn't about needing somebody to come and respond. And that's something to maybe try if you're a little concerned about your school staff overreacting to remote monitoring, mm. because I have seen that happen a lot. People yes. share with their school staff and then suddenly their second grader is pulled from class yes. every 45 minutes because of these alerts and alarms that making people nervous. And just a little tip, it's much harder to take it back because then you have to have an uncomfortable conversation. So you can just say, hey, we just got this technology. We're going to try it this way and then we can reevaluate as we go. And Absolutely. even if there's other students in the school, but you know, one of the things I always talk about too is everybody manages diabetes differently. Some schools understand this. Some schools want everybody to do it the same way. And you, you really kind of have to say sometimes, we found this worked really well for us. And if you really need to, you can pull out, you know, our doctor says, because I got pushed back for a long time about not sharing his numbers with school staff yes. and about not having him check in. And so you kind of have to make your own way sometimes on this. So don't be afraid to do that. So I'm glad to hear you say that. And I think that's really good advice. Yeah. And the other thing that I would do, and this was a tip that my diabetes nurse educator gave to my family, you know, years ago, 
was that you don't really want to be making significant dosing changes the week or two before school starts. Mm. You know, if you have to adjust a basal rate 0.1 for a four hour time period, sure. But, you know, it's not actually the best time to be starting new technology, starting a whole new pump regimen, because you want to go into this new experience as confident as possible with the least amount of variables, right? If you are as confident as you can be with the rates and the ratios and the correction factors status quo, especially if you're leaning towards like a little bit of like a higher target or wanting that little kind of buffer zone those first few weeks, it's not necessarily a good time to make a ton of changes. A couple other tips for the first week is that, you know, I would also make sure that Try and bring in, you know, especially for the elementary school grades where the parents are doing a lot of kind of maybe packing up the school lunches and maybe labeling with post-it notes, carb counts, that sort of thing. I know that's a popular plan for a lot of parents. Start bringing those foods and snacks into the house, you know, now, the week or two before school starts. Getting your kid used to eating those foods and see if you can start to notice a pattern on what you know, those types of lunches might do to your kid's blood sugar. So it's not a surprise or, you know, you can basically start to do a little bit of prediction. I mean, I know you can't expect to eat one thing three days in a row and have the same result. That's just diabetes, right, Stacey? (laughs) Um, And it's one less variable and allows a parent to trust a little bit more and not have to worry as much. I would I love also, that idea. Yeah, I would also say, you know, if you're using a pump, don't change your site the morning of the first day of school if you can <laughs> avoid it. You know, don't change your site the night before even. Get a good site in, say 24 hours before, and make sure that you're getting the insulin you need and that there's a lot of extra stuff heading into school. That okay, happens. let's talk about that. That's the, that's one of my questions. Okay. I, I want to talk. You want to talk about independence, yeah, in different stages. But let's talk about bringing stuff to school and supplies and that kind of thing. Different schools have different policies on this. We always left a bunch of stuff at school, even in elementary school, when I would probably go to do a site change if the nurse wasn't there that day. I left everything at school. And then Benny had a little bag that he would carry back and forth with a few supplies in it as well. Any thoughts on that? That sounds pretty common to me. I mean, I, again, it depends on, you know, the age and and the exact school. You know, there are some high schools that are, that have a campus almost, that have multiple buildings where it could be a 10 minute walk to get to the the nearest nurse's office. So you're going to want to have an extra site in your backpack and glucose tabs and a charger, God forbid your dash or your pump or your phone like needs to be charged in order to get access to data. That's more of the, the high school piece. And I think regardless, there should be a backup home base for, you know, almost like I, you know, I work very closely with a lot of young adults and college students. You know, you want to have that sick day kit. You want to have that kind of emergency stash And it's about, you know, expecting the unexpected, but being prepared, always having, regardless if you're on, you know, multiple daily injections or uh, using an insulin pump, you want to have a backup way of knowing your blood sugar, of receiving insulin, and making sure that all devices are able to do what you want them to do. So that means always having a glucagon and that it's not expired. But, you know, a vial of insulin or pens and syringes, extra sites, extra pump sites, and and a meter and strips and and lancets. And the other thing, and, and this is what I've learned from a couple of recent families that I've seen, is actually an extra set of clothes. A mom told me this trick for my incoming kindergartner. She's fully potty trained, but... There's something about nerves and that first week of school, the last thing you want is to not have extra clothes. And this is sort of a, a, maybe a non-diabetes related thing, but this has happened to me in high school and I was not on a pump. I gave an injection at lunch in the nurse's office and it was a gusher. Oh geez. And I got blood all over my like cool white shirt that I was wearing. And I had, I drove to school. I had to go home and change. 
So it's not a bad idea. God forbid, you know, your sight rips out and there's blood everywhere or God forbid something happens and you can't wear the clothes you're wearing to school that day. Have a change of clothes and having, you know, batteries, chargers, and of course, glucose tabs, your preferred choice of of treating a low and, and some protein on hand. Where you kind of stash stuff, you know, if you're in elementary, middle school, and you're really only in one or two classrooms, I would highly recommend having, you know, maybe a smaller stash with a Ziploc baggie or a a bin within, you know, in the teacher's desk or drawer or, you know, designated area. But I would also really make sure that there's a home base in the school nurse. A tip there, though, is that oftentimes the school nurse's office is locked. So having that conversation about will this always be accessible if it's locked, knowing there are an emergency needed medical things in there. So that's just another question to make sure that you ask. I know there's, you know, concern about security and schools and all of the horrible things that happen in schools. So just keeping in mind that sometimes a school nurse can be locked at random times throughout the day. And knowing who has the key, because exactly. there's somebody in the office who has yes. the key. We, yes. As I said, we did not have a full-time school nurse. So yeah. these are all issues that we've had to address. And it went very well. I mean, in schools that do not have nurses full-time, the rest of the staff gets it. Like, they know. And there's always someone who's deputized, right? They're not a nurse, but they can treat right. XYZ. They know who to call if they can't. They can certainly do as much diabetes stuff as any of us who aren't medical people. Right. I mean, I'm certainly not one. It's just about identifying the right yeah. person. And sometimes, you know, your 504 coordinator or your guidance counselor, or school counselor, their sister's daughter may have type one or, you know, you, you know, and they may be the go-to type one person at the school. So for all the parents listening who are like, oh, I don't have a school nurse at my school all the time, find someone to get on your side. Let's talk about independence. Sure. Um, I'm a big believer in even a kindergartner being as independent as possible. As I mentioned, Benny was checking his own blood sugar at, you know, times during the day with supervision. I always have to say that he's not doing it himself when he's five years old, but he knew enough to do his own finger sticks. He knew how to use his pump, but he also, he had to do it with supervision. It wasn't an option for him to just do it on his own. And we gradually changed things until he got super independent, fabulous fourth and fifth grade. And then like many middle schoolers kind of lost his mind, but wanted to be super independent, right? Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. He doesn't want to go show people everything. He doesn't want to have someone looking over his shoulder, but he kind of needed it. I've shared what we've done a million times and I can talk about it again, but I'm curious what you do for kids who are in that weird stage of wanting their independence, but honestly, maybe not super 100% ready. Oh, this is like the sweet spot. And mm-hmm. as a social worker and a you know certified diabetes care and education specialist, this is like the work that I love to do because it is so, so tough. And especially for parents like you, Stacey, where your kid was diagnosed on the younger, very young, you know, where you were so used to having some of that control and, mm-hmm. and dosing decisions and all that and slowly starting to peel that away and meeting the child where they're comfort level and confidence level is, it can be a real challenge. Again, this goes back to it depends. You know, that's every social worker's like favorite way to respond to any question. (laughs) It depends. And everybody hates that. And, you know, I would say this is when you really have to have really good, solid communication as a family. Any sort of task or behavior that your child is wanting to do, I would make sure that that you all as a team feel comfortable with them mastering it in at least two situations outside of school, whether that is home and at Benny's best friend's house or home and a grandparent's house, making sure that this isn't the first time, that school isn't the first place where they are wanting to give insulin on their own or wanting to not visit the school nurse. You know, if they mastered this and had a great experience, you know, attending a non-diabetes camp or like was with grandparents all summer or, and they come to you and are proving to you that, that this is what they feel like will make them be a better student, then make sure that that is talked about with the school nurse or you know, the asthma coordinator, just kidding, the, the diabetes coordinator, you know, whoever, whoever it is, and that that can, level of communication and 
task of dosing or, you know, not necessarily visiting the school nurse is included in the plan. Because we all know that when when something like when the child decides to do something and another adult isn't notified, that's when things can start to go south. So I, my advice here would just be make sure you prepare in advance. And if you don't think you're ready, again, have the same type of conversation where, you know what, thank you so much for I'm so glad that you want to start doing this on your own. Let's practice together to make sure that everyone is ready. And then, you know, maybe October 1st, you set a date or a goal where everybody works on this outside of school so you can be ready to go and implement it in this new setting. It's so hard. I'm it's just so thinking, hard. <laughs> I'm going back to, to middle school and, and Benny and I have been very open about this. He would not mind me sharing. Middle school was very difficult for diabetes management because he forgot the a lot. The worst. Isn't it the worst? The worst. And so my advice would be, and it's hard when you're in it, you know, now that I'm beyond it and I can kind of see, I, I, I do think that letting him be more independent in middle school, even though he was out of range more than I would have liked, he forgot to bowl this more than I would have liked, it actually paid off mm. down the line in knowing that he knew that he wouldn't get in trouble. He knew that he could trust us. He knew that he wanted to feel better. Right. And it was so hard at the time. And I was so frustrated. And now, I mean, most of not everybody in the diabetes community has this, obviously, but many of you, as you listen, you know, we have these AID systems, we have hybrid closed loop systems. You know, we didn't have that in middle school. And it makes a huge difference. It doesn't mean your kid's going to be in perfect range, but it, someone explained it to me recently. Maybe it was you, Anna, about having <laughs> like, you know, the bumpers like you have in bowling. Yes. You know, these AID systems give you those bumpers. So your kid may like bonk around the sides, <laughs> but generally speaking, they're going to be really safe. And I'm so thrilled because I think that gives these middle schoolers, <laughs> their brains have just left their bodies. We have to just give them empathy and grace. And it's so hard when you're in it. I mean, it's I was so not, yes, Benny, you in it. I mean, not say I, I gave you grace. <laughs> if, if my mom knew what my blood sugars were in middle school, I don't know. And that's my Omnipod beeping. I apologize in the background. Oh, that's um, so funny. I don't think I heard it. But I, I do think to, to your point, when you talk about like our goal is October 1st, I think it's important. And I know you mean this, but let's be yes. obvious about it. I think it's important to talk about, well, the goal here isn't perfect blood sugar management. It isn't 100% Absolutely time and range, right? not. No. The goal is keeping everyone on the same page to prevent you know, these adverse outcomes. Of course, we want to prevent major high blood sugars and you know DKA and very severe lows but it's it's talking about what to do in the meantime and at the end of the day we want kids you know giving insulin is a non-negotiable and like you said to the AID point whether it's you know a control IQ or a Medtronic or now the Omnipod 5 knowing that they're able to be in school and live a healthy life with diabetes and that is amazing that we have these systems to do that. Yeah. And it's letting the kids be kids. I'm going to say this even though I'm reluctant to say it, especially the first few weeks, it's about building good habits. A blood sugar of 300 the first couple days of school is not going to have long-term damage. It it may sure. mentally drive you crazy, but it's about the approach. You know, you come home from school, you ask the kid, what did they do today, blah 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 before, and everybody knows this, you don't nag and talk about diabetes the second they walk in the door. Hey, so, you know, where did you sit today at lunch? You know, if you're a mom or a dad and you're concerned about their blood sugar management during the day, especially those middle school years when, let's be honest, everybody forgets, or, you know, you think the kid went to the school nurse, then they call and they're like, no, we didn't get a visit from so-and-so today. And then you're (laughs) like, oh God. And that happens all the time. Classic 12-year-olds. But you have this conversation where you're asking questions about things that you don't really care to know the answer to, but it's allowing the student to put themselves back in that situation and feel more empowered to talk about it and open up about, you know, say where they sat at lunch and, oh, well, do you think maybe next time we could work out a plan on if you were sitting next to so-and-so at lunch, we can come up with a better way to bolus? Or why do you think maybe our blood sugar is going to 300 and let's solve this problem together? Because we nobody wants a blood sugar of 300. The kid doesn't feel good. It doesn't sit well with anybody. And I think those first few weeks, like you said, Stacey, we have to give ourselves grace. And it's all about building better habits. And whether you attach a date 
to a goal of some sort of independent task or behavior is one thing. I just threw that out there because I'm a big smart goal person. And if you're setting goals together as whether it's a a patient family goal setting or it's a parent child nurse, you know, goal setting, if everybody's on the same page, everyone's going to feel really satisfied when that goal is attained. So it's all about building better habits to get to that end result. I like the idea too, and we did this a lot of if if the school was doing something that I wasn't crazy about, I would say, hey, let's revisit this on, like you said, October 1st. Yeah. This is okay for now, but I think we can do better, or I think that this would be better for my child. So let's do it on such and such a date, you know, and, and kind of revisit it. I think it um, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. There are so many resources out there. And I think, you know, a lot of people think that they're the only family going through this. You know, it's mm. it's like when you bring a newborn home from the hospital and you're in it and you're up at 2 a.m. When you're home from diabetes diagnosis and you're like, again, am I the only one up at 3 a.m. staring at a, at a Dexcom and wondering, you know, how many more glucose tabs I shove into this kid's mouth? It's the same type of thing. You are not alone. And there are so many resources online and offline for support out there. And I just opened my own practice and have a pretty cool special going on, which is going to allow parents and families to have additional one-on-one support. It's called 30 for 30. So for 30 minutes, for $30, you can have one-on-one support, work with me, review your 504 plan, help design a 504 plan or any sort of back to school plan, whether it's talking about sports, whether it's talking about independence with your teenager whether you're talking about sibling struggles or just mental health in general for mom or dad about this transition back to school because it is a lot. So I just want people to know that 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 exists and it's a special going on through the end of September. Very cool. Well, Anna, thank you so much. It's always fabulous to talk with you. I love talking with you, Stacey. And you've been there. You've been through this. So (laughs) I hope that parents can get over this little like mini mini roller coaster hump of of this back to school time because it's it's fun it's exciting and i think you know at the end of the day a kid is a kid um who just happens to live with with type 1 you're listening to diabetes connections with stacy sims More information about school and 504 plans and Anna's special offer. I will link all of that up at diabetes-connections.com. Every episode has its own homepage. And again, examples of 504 plans and all of the resources. There's so many from JDRF and ADA. Uh, If you need that, I will put those in the show notes as well. So you kind of have them all in one place. We've done a lot of back to school episodes over the year, almost every August for sure. Over the last, gosh, this would be like eight years now. So you can go to the website and use the search box. We've got a great search engine. Just put back to school or 504 and lots of episodes will pop up. Back to school can also mean that mom wants a little bit of time for herself. I will be talking about how to get that. Even with the kids in school, we struggle with that, don't we? But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And I get a lot of questions about Dexcom coverage for people on Medicare. And why not? It's not as though you stop needing a CGM the minute you turn 65. The good news is that the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitoring System is covered for Medicare for patients who meet the coverage criteria. If you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes and intensively manage insulin, you may be covered. To find out more about what that means and if you qualify, check out Dexcom.com slash G6 dash Medicare. I'm going to link that up in this episode. You don't have to remember the full link there. You're going to want to talk to your doctor and you may even be able to get your Dexcom supplies at the pharmacy, saving time and money. Learn more at, again, Dexcom.com slash G6 dash Medicare. Have you heard about my mom's night out? I am so excited about this. I have created an event. This is a brand new standalone event. It is Diabetes Connections presents Mom's Night Out. And it's happening in January in Charlotte, here in North Carolina, where I live. But it's an overnight event. So if you live within driving distance, even if it's a couple of hours, grab a couple of friends and plan on coming. This is a conference for moms of kids with diabetes. If you go to diabetes-connections.com, click on events, you will see it there. A lot of you have already signed up to save the date and get the emails on this. And I appreciate it so much. This week, we should have, it might already be up already. We should have the ticketing page ready to go. You can see more about what's going to happen. 
You can see more about what you get, the registration and the hotel, the group room block, the discounted rate will all be opening. It's going to be a blast. I'll be sharing more information about what sponsors have signed up, who's going to be there. You know, the idea here is that you get a big tech fair. You get to see and touch all the diabetes technology that the kids use. You get to ask your questions in an environment where your kids aren't nudging you, right? You're going to be able to speak to a diabetes educator, get your questions answered one-on-one. We're going to have signups in advance for that. And we're also going to have a speaker on Saturday morning to talk to you about what moms need to get energized, to get confident in care of kids with type 1, and really just feel like you're not alone and you can do this. It's going to be a really upbeat atmosphere. And if you're a veteran mom like me, you've been doing this for a while, you can just come for the social atmosphere. We're going to have cocktails. We're going to have crafts. We're going to have dinner. We're going to have swag bags. It's going to be a good time. Again, that is Diabetes Connections presents Mom's Night Out January 20th and 21st in Charlotte. I got to tell you my big dream, because if you listen this long, you're in the club. If this goes well, I want to do this in different cities. I want to go to the Northeast next, and then maybe we'll go to the West Coast. I think there's a lot of moms who want to do something like this. And I think there's a huge need for more support for moms. If that's you or you know a mom, definitely sign up or, you know, if you have questions, let me know. But I am so thrilled to get this off the ground. All right. We will have a newscast this week. We've got lots more good stuff to come. Thank you for your questions about Benny, the interview with him about summer camp, eight weeks away from home with no remote monitoring, totally independent. Oh, my goodness. We'll be talking about that coming up shortly. Thank you to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here soon. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>